Hello, hello, hello. Hi, and welcome to What Do Artists Need? Policy and Advocacy Town Hall, hosted by New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. I am Melanie Green of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. I am a dark-skinned Black woman. I have coily hair cascading from the crown of my head. I am wearing big, almost teardrop-like earrings. Um, I have on a yellow shirt and there is a solid background behind me. So we acknowledge that our advocacy work takes place on the traditional land of the Lenape peoples, past and present. We honor the land and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations, including the enslaved people of African descent whose labor built this city. So there will be a transcription that happens throughout the town hall and we're gonna put the link for it in the chat. Um, and it's also, I'll just say uh, where it's available. It is at https colon forward slash forward slash E-A-S-T dot T-Y-P-E W-E-L-L dot C-O-M forward slash F-L-E-J-G-F-G-F. So for those of you who are already part of the New Yorkers for Cultural and Arts community, welcome back. If this is your first time, thank you for joining us. I'm going to just give you a little, a quick background about us. So New Yorkers for Cultural and Arts is an advocacy organization that promotes access and equity for all New Yorkers to engage in culture and art. And we fight for sustainable public policy and public funding for cultural groups of every size and in every borough. We have over 135 coalition members that work collectively across the sector. We coordinate visits with city council members. We support testimonies at city council hearings. We host town halls and rallies around policy and we provide data advocacy tools, including data sheets and online material. So you can learn more about us at www.ny4ca.org. And if you're not already a coalition member, please feel free to join us. So our work has been focused um, on cultural organizations of all sizes. And with this particular town hall, we hope to build robust advocacy for independent artists and cultural workers. As a in practicing independent artist myself, this is something that, that is very, very close to home. So, all right, we're gonna hear um, from an exciting group of folks with unique and passionate perspectives on what advocacy efforts and policy work are needed for independent artists in New York City to thrive. Um, before I, I introduce our first um, speaker, I just wanna give a big shout out to Rhett Law for, pro for providing us with our pre-show vibes. Thank you so much. Um, and now we will hear from Audrey Wardenen, who is a dance artist, scientist, and co-founder of Hype Access. Welcome, Audrey. Hi, thank you, Melanie. This is Audrey speaking. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a thin white woman with olive skin and blue eyes, shoulder length hair with a big blonde chunk on the top side. I'm in a bedroom with a window to my left and light streaming through. I'm wearing a blue dress with a yellow stripe and red lipstick. And I'm hypermobile, which means that all my joints tend to bend really far. So when I gesticulate, my fingers bend backwards a bit. Um, and I'm a disabled dance artist and scientist and I co-run Hype Access. Um, I was invited today to talk about policy and advocacy efforts in city and state government. And I'm also gonna add community because community is bringing this panel together and who this panel is in service of. My community includes disabled, sick, neurodivergent artists, scientists, practitioners, and non-disabled folks, all who I love. I'm interested in the knowledge and wisdom that comes from disabled communities. And I think disability arts is rad and transformative. The community I have learned from and with works from a praxis of disability justice and anti-capitalism. And the intersection of race and disability is essential because the disability rights movement was very white and benefited white disabled people. 
Community shifts must happen before or at the very least at the same time that advocacy and policy begin to address the central role of ableism within our infrastructure and systems, bearing its teeth during this pandemic to those privileged enough to ignore it previously. For example, this panel was not marketed with accessibility in mind, so I'm going to provide information geared more toward learning about disability and the necessity of disabled leadership. When we talk about policy shifts for disabled artists, we're going to talk about policy shifts for disabled people. 26% of people are disabled. 43% of households have pre-existing conditions, which under the ADA uh, qualifies them as disabled, regardless of if they identify that way or not. The majority of people disabled by our current systems are black and brown and indigenous. The Americans with Disabilities Act is rarely enforced. Institutions are not governmentally supported in making the changes necessary to provide the bare minimum of accessibility, let alone quality of life support. And if you have wealth and are disabled, you can buy the care you need and sue if you are wronged enough to prove it. Accessibility does not exist in the mainstream dance community. Hire disabled artists. We all must coordinate our efforts at the local and state level to address federal infrastructure by radically implementing processes of care within our policy work. And to touch on specific policy, I'm going to read a list of changes that is by no means exhaustive. Everything I'm going to say I have learned. Undo the cuts to consumer directed personal assistance Medicaid program that Cuomo pushed through during the height of the pandemic. Disabled people have a right to choose who cares for them, hire them, fire them, and not be forced into institutions where their lives are at a higher risk. Throw out the rule that disabled people on SSI and SSDI cannot have more than 2,000 in assets to be eligible to continue to receive government support. Make SSI a truly livable wage, at least $600 per week plus base level unemployment, since some of us have now experienced some form of universal income. The highest SSI rate in 2020 was $783 per month. Increase the substantial gainful activity limit for people on SSI so people can earn enough money to support themselves without being disqualified. Everyone really needs to pay attention to the HEALS bill, L standing for liability protection. If you, disabled or non-disabled, get exposed to COVID-19 at your school, job, or institution, they are no longer um, legally liable for the impact that it may have on you. And this weakens the Americans with Disabilities Act and will disproportionately impact black and brown and indigenous disabled people. Yes to universal income, healthcare, affordable housing, accessible public transit, and the list goes on. But if you're going to advocate and move toward these things for non-disabled people, we need to start with what already exists and go from there. The current standard for a version of universal income and healthcare for people who qualify are SSI, SSDI, Medicaid and Medicare, and disabled people have a lot to say about that. The way we proceed from here and make informed decisions on what to replace these choices with, how to provide adequate livable support, equity, and justice, is to hire disabled leadership to spearhead these changes in advocacy efforts. This should be done at the local and state level, putting pressure on the state to begin moving toward the federal changes that are essential if we want to make art and culture making accessible, livable, innovative, and system changing. Disabled people are already doing this, leading the way in radical access and community support. For these social and policy shifts to carry the entire community, including the most impacted, they have to be guided by disability justice, creating an ecosystem that culturally thrives and supports the people who are here and will continue to be here. But before we can talk about policy, our non-disabled community must address the necessary infrastructural and interpersonal communication practices that are not accessible event organizing that isn't accessible, art making that isn't accessible, educational practices that aren't accessible, advocacy and policy spaces that aren't accessible. There can't be only one disabled person in the room. I'm gonna end with a quote from the Sins and Valid Disability Justice Primer. And this section was written in collaboration with Health Justice Commons, um, both groups who I highly recommend looking into. What ableism hides, as does every interconnected system of oppression, is that our own survival as disabled people instills us with powerful wisdom that is necessary now more than ever for our human and planetary survival. Thank you all for being here. End thought. Audrey, thank you so much uh, for sharing your wisdom and your work and for really making us aware of and to be mindful of the necessary care that actually has to go into policy making in addition to mad learning like there's a lot of learning that has to happen as well 
Um, thank you. Um, so up next, we have Benedict Wynn, who is an artist, dancer, and curator. Hi everyone, um, my name is Benedict. My pronouns are they, them. Thank you for, to everyone for being here, um, for spending part of your weekly Zoom allotment on this discussion. Um, I am a Vietnamese American, non-binary person with wavy black hair, tan skin. I'm wearing dark red lipstick um, and I'm sitting in front of a white wall with a bookshelf with some books on it. Um, I'm speaking from Anape Hoking and Wappinger lands or the South Bronx. Um, since, uh, since COVID-19 has arrived, I've been more or less withdrawn Been thinking a lot about my capacity, how that's changed. Um, been thinking about scale, about impact of work about degrowth. I've been thinking about um, celebrities hopping on OnlyFans and their YouTube channels and their sponsorships. I've been thinking about how us scrappy artists fit into that, you know, cult of individual branding and personal success. Um, I've also been thinking about how a lot of the most recent discussions about racism in institutions has been fueled by the ongoing spectacle epidemic of black death in this country. Um, and um, how these discussions shouldn't be predicated on that ongoing police brutality and violence for us to consider how to re reimagine the world that we're living and working in. Um, so uh, yeah, I've been um, working in the field uh, for about five years as an adult, freelancing as a cater waiter, tutor, arts administrator, grant writer, dancer for different projects, writing for my hundred dollar articles, curating here and there. Um, and I think when people uh, you know, find out what I've been able to do in my time here. Um, they're like, impressed sometimes, which I have a weird relationship to. Um, but I think like how I've been able to scrabble together my livelihood is not a goal. Like beyond the burnout, um, I've been thinking of that and the toll that this rhythm has taken on my body, I've been thinking about how I've played the game over the past few years, played into respectability politics, how I've made myself someone tolerable or palatable to white institutions and white culture. And even so, white people in institutions have been continuously, repeatedly violent in microaggressive, overtly aggressive ways over the years. I've seen curators wag their fingers at me. I've seen people shout racist things at me. I, I, you know, and I'm just one person and I have way too many receipts on gross behavior of gross people in the field. Um, and the thing about freelancing is that I wonder whether it's just me. Um, I wonder whether other people experience this. Um, I wonder why when I respond to institutions why they respond, oh, we'll work on it, we'll do more diversity and equity and inclusion trainings, blah, 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 that bullshit. Um, there's a tweet that went viral in June by Lisa Ko that said, the revolution will not be diversity and equity inclusion trainings. Um, this maybe isn't a systemic level, system level recommendation, but I've been thinking about us starting to call shit out, um, air out, dirty laundry, send people packing because white people in power just get to be grossly violent and get away with it because things happen in isolation. Um, and I think where I, this extends systematically is just the nonprofit industrial complex at large. Um, why are executive 
directors and paid over $100,000 a year to make artists compete for their approval and for their $1,000 commission. Why are boards full of rich people deciding the future of art organizations that are meant to serve artists? Why do we continue to forgive and shove violent behavior under the rug? Um, the, the scarcity mindset plays, has played such an influential role in my thinking, um, not wanting to cause financial ruin to an artist or an organization. Why I continue to accept, why I continue to accept low or no pay for work that I do. Um, so yeah, burn this shit down, I'm over it. Um, instead, I've been, I'll finish with just thinking about ways of creating and continuing to be an artist and share my work that doesn't depend on the nonprofit industrial complex to validate me. Um, ways to be in smaller, more close-knit communities with artists and people that I love and trust. Um, I'm thinking of ways of working that don't rely on algorithms decided by platforms like Instagram, Facebook, etc. cetera. Um, I'm thinking of things beyond the cult of individual artist ambition and celebrity. And um, that's where I'm thinking. Thank you so much. This is Benedict. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Benedict. I can tell you the hustle is not isolated nor your experience. So thank you for highlighting a lot of information. We have a lot to sort of ruminate and uh, gestate on. So thank you so much. Um, so up next, we have Kat Kirk and David Goncier of Dance Artists National Collective, also known as Dank. Hello, my name is Kat Kirk. My preferred pronouns are she, her. I'm a black woman with a shaved head, wearing multiple gold hoops and a gold necklace and a mint green slip dress. I am in a room with gray walls and bunk beds to my right. Uh, thank you all for having me take part in this offering. Being a general member and more recently volunteering more of my time as a steering committee member of Dance Artists National Collective or DANK as we like to call it. Uh, I've been in conversation with a growing and diverse group of dance artists who have been discussing, verbalizing, manifesting and putting into action what we want to see out of the dance and arts field as a workplace. Uh, when I think on a more personal level about some of the challenges that I have faced in my progression and career as a performing artist, I've experienced and continue to witness a deep weaponization of education, intellect, and language that is and can be really exclusive, especially to Black, Indigenous, people of color. Uh, whether folks, you know, flex this muscle consciously or unconsciously, there needs to be real awareness of how language can stifle folks in their agency and confidence in advocating for themselves and in asking questions to understand. Uh, you know, like how hard is it to ask the important questions when you really don't know where to begin? When you're overwhelmed with new information and maybe you not along hoping you're kind of faking it to make it but then maybe you also end up nodding along to being in an exclusive contract or you weren't given the time and privacy to thoroughly go through and be able to understand what it is you may be signing up for as a contracted or employed dance artist or performing artist uh, within dank our general membership of dance artists which includes dance artists of any scope, which can and does go you know, far beyond and outside of performing artistry. Um, we've been working on our first draft of a letter of agreement that can be used in solidarity to advocate for ourselves and signal the change that we're all really craving to exist in the spaces that value dance artists as workers, you know, spaces that are inclusive, representative, safe from harassment, safe from assault, safe from bigotry. Uh, we're looking at what what works well in other workplaces and seeing how we too can implement things like late fees for late pay and protection from cancellation fees uh, educational options that employers and contractors can have access to to provide benefits like healthcare, retirement 
annual cost of living increases, general wage raises that can support dance artists in a way that enables more independence and can be reflected positively uh, into things like the housing and food disparities that so many of us performing artists and cultural workers face. Uh, and if those needs can't be met, how can we advocate for ourselves and negotiate in healthy and non-punitive ways? How can we offer alternative benefits and options that can be more realistic for a smaller budget that they don't only place sacrifices and harm the working artists within that project? Um, so, so much of what is needed centers around a need for transparency, a need to relinquish the revolving door that is the casting of an arts project, uh, to protect dance artists as workers and their ability to engage question and challenge without the fear of punishment and firing. The amount of stories of folks being let go for various and random reasons when it's clear that it was after speaking up and out about need to change to better support dancers is one too many and it continues today. Uh, I would love to learn from our collective fatigue and burnout and to acknowledge how and why rushing to get even some of these things done lifts up white supremacist structures of a first come first serve basis type of structure. You know, like how those systemic racist structures, they clearly kind of dictate that black indigenous people of color that, you know, we're not meant to come first. We're not, um, that, that support isn't there. I would love for easily accessible resources to exist that offer generous funding for projects to be able to support the dance artists they strive to hire. I would love for artists and cultural workers to have resources to arm themselves with information to better understand what they may be signing up for when entering a new workplace or even deciding to return. Um, and I would love to have protections against unfair and biased firings and also to provide more financial support to ease and uplift the transition for contractors to become employers and to get more dance artists working as protected employees. Thanks. Thank you, Kat. Hi, everybody. I'm David Gantz here. Um, I am a co-founder and member of the steering committee of Dance Artists National Collective. I have the great pleasure of working with Kat Kirk on this project um, alongside uh, our other members of the steering committee, um, Alex Rodebaugh, Effie Allison, Antoine Byers. Um, and it's been a long road on this project. I, I'm, I wanna say I'm really happy to be here and I thank uh, the, <laughs> Uh, host for inviting us here today um, to speak on the topic of just what really asking what artists need. DANC was founded um, out of a drive to empower dancers to answer that question for themselves as much as possible and to allow them to create upward pressure for that, for those needs, to speak for those needs. We have actually, it was interesting in being asked to, to be part of this panel, we were the conversation is framed around uh, around policy and advocacy uh, at more like governmental level, and it's a it was interesting for me to think about because we actually we we think we talk about it we talk about it a lot, but we think about in our daily work um, immediately trying to give people information to arm themselves. Um, as Kat was saying, we've been working on a floating letter of agreement um, that we've had a number of amazing volunteers who work with our organization who've been. Uh, doing research uh, to help us get as many perspectives in as we can to build a document that can be flexible enough, like Kat said, to work in a variety of working environments, but also doesn't take certain things as flexible, such as access, such as equity, such as the need for dancers to eat and pay for places to live, um, and to have dignity in their work. And the LOA and the accompanying document, which we're calling a negotiating toolkit, um, is aimed at arming dancers to enter a room to negotiate for themselves as the adults in the room. Because if there's anything we've learned over time, it is that the people who run our organizations and our smaller companies, our larger companies, are not there to negotiate with us as equals and they are not there to treat us as adults. We are diminished at almost every turn in terms of what our art is work, 
what our art is worth, excuse me, what our work uh, entitles us to. And we're tired of it. And it turns out a whole lot of other dancers are really tired of it. That exhaustion that Benedict was speaking to before so eloquently is felt by, it turns out, a huge portion of our community. And we are working to get as much of that community together on this project to uh, create the upward force to change our working situations. COVID has been an unbelievable, unimaginable tragedy globally. But if it can be said to have done anything positive, it is that it has given us a pause in that race that we are constantly working in to stop and talk realistically about all the things that normally we have a little bit of time to think about and complain about on a daily basis, but we're too busy. We're on our way to our other three jobs. Um, now, unfortunately, most of us are not working at all, and it has given people a lot of time uh, to put their energies towards advocating for themselves. And advocating for ourselves is really uh, what the idea that Dank was founded on. So we, yeah, we want to level the playing field for dancers, all dancers, not just dancers who work in ballet companies, not just dancers who work for white modern dance companies, but all dancers everywhere to be able to say that they are worth something, that their work is work, that they are workers who have a right to survive in this culture that we live in, just as everybody else does. Um, that's, I think, where I'll leave it. So thank you so much for the invitation today. Uh, I very much appreciate being here. Thank you, Kat and David. Um, I think what you've so eloquently um, sort of revealed in, in your sharing is that there are there's information that happens on a lot of different levels, right? So there's the immediate um, person to person work that needs to happen in addition to the local advocacy, in addition to the federal. So there's a lot of different tentacles to this. And, and even with the document that you're working on, I'm sure that there are folks across a lot of different disciplines that could benefit from this type of information. And um, what's exciting is that there is like, because this work is happening, that, um, that we can continue to sort of build a uh, coalition work around making these policies super strong. Um, my last point I wanted to say about COVID is that, yes, it is it is a absolute uh, tragedy. And what it has done, I feel, is completely um, illuminated all of the the sort of cracks in the infrastructure. The pro it has amplified the problems that we are um, currently existing in, including housing, including um, accessibility. There's there's so many things, and um, yeah, now a lot of us we have more time to uh, work on it. And think about it and talk about it because we're not you know running to five places in a day so um thank you so much for being here and also i just want to throw this question out for you to think about and uh, we'll, we'll sort of tackle it in the uh, question and answer portion and also wanted to, to give to the other panelists which is um so as we start to reimagine rebuilding new york city as a sustainable space for independent artists what do you feel is most needed? Like, what is the thing that you want to put your weight behind? So I just want to give you that to think about um, as we listen to some more offerings, and then we'll tackle that a little later. So up next, we have Sugar Vendil. Sugar is a composer, pianist, and inter eh, sorry, an interdisciplinary artist. So we'll hear from Sugar. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Um, great. Um, so um, this is Sugar speaking. Um, I am a Filipino American. Um, I have long hair, <clears throat> long black hair with wand tips and there's a piano behind me um, and windows to my right, your left probably. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit of today about you know my experience um, is trying to live as an artist in New York City. Um, I've been here for 19 years, <clears throat> starting when I came here for school to get my degree in classical piano performance. Um, so as Melanie mentioned, I'm still a pianist, and, but I'm also now a chamber musician, composer, and interdisciplinary artist. Um, so, you know, my finances are more stable now, but I just, I remember so clearly how difficult it was when I was younger. Like I can, I will never forget it. I'm, I'm very cheap in weird ways because that still stays with me, that difficulty. Um, it 
still feels luxurious to get coffee out. Um, and I'm still paying, you know, about paying off about seventy thousand dollars in student loans, um, which I was only able to start making payments on like three years ago. Um, can't let it get to your head. It's not like credit card debt. Get on the phone with them, um, and you know, likely you can get it so that you have zero dollars due. I mean, and it's a little less stressful that way. Try not to let it mess with you. You know, keep being an artist. Um, so I started to try to build a private piano studio, which means getting private students after getting my bachelor's degree while working both part-time at a restaurant job and a music school in Queens that only did 50 minute lessons. So you wouldn't even get paid for the full hour you were actually there. It's so awful how exploitative shit is, even though like they were, it was like run by another pianist. Um, so teaching is what pays decently if you can build a studio, but it takes so long. So I think it took me like nine years to build my studio to the point where it was word of mouth, but you know, it's a long time. So while I was building the studio, I'd always have another job, um, which, you know, whether it was event production or working retail at the MoMA store another time. And oh yeah, and then I was an intern and eventually an assistant at a creative agency. And all that time I was still trying to practice um, build my music ensemble that I started in grad school called the Nouveau Classical Project. Um, and like, at the time I'm like, oh yeah, I'm doing it. And I mean, that's a lot. I didn't even think about how much that was. I, I thought that was so normal and it is, but it shouldn't be. Um, and I founded that ensemble with $175. This was all pre Kickstarter era. Um, and I'm like, I don't know like how, like, like what I was thinking, but, you know, I think even though we're all broke, you know, sometimes like we're ultimately optimists and I think, you know, hope is what keeps us going. So yeah, that's why we're artists. Um, so, you know, where am I with this? Sorry. Yeah. So like, yeah, it was just really difficult. And obviously rent is the, was always like the highest line item in the budget and I had heard about artist housing, but I'd also heard that no one leaves and there was just no information readily available. And so I couldn't figure that out. Um, so, I mean, a lot of us are in financially precarious situations and it's just so astonishing and admirable that we're all, we're all doing this. So, you know, kudos to everyone here, um, but we could do with it, you know, being less, a little less of a struggle. Um, I think we need, um, we need to like, there needs to be more subsidized and artist housing available. And we need that information just to be out there. It's just such a mystery. There's so much red tape. Um, they, they don't even tell you like when you're in school, like how to do this, even though they know you're going to stay and live, try to live here. Um, but you don't know about these things that are available. Um, and I mean, you know, artists aside, like the rent is just, too high in New York for anyone, um, you know, you know, non-artists that are like, you know, trying to have a family and, um, and live here. It's just insane. There just needs to be, uh, you know, more policy to keep that shit under control. Um, and also we need, um, as Audrey mentioned, we need universal health care. Um, and, you know, it's not just the insurance companies, it's these hospitals that are that are like, they're insanely expensive. It costs more to sleep there than in a luxury hotel. Someone tweeted the other day that her dad was in a hospital for like two days and the room and board, room and board fee was like 138K. <laughs> That's insane. Um, and we do need universal basic income. Um, you know, it's just, this is the norm in some other countries and it seems to be working out and, and that we were able to do it. Like, I was so surprised when they were able to just do that. Um, I was like, wait, where, where did this, Melanie and I actually were, <laughs> we were talking on the phone. We were like, wait, where did that money come from? Like they've been hoarding it. People, people are hoarding this money and they should be giving it to people. Um, so that, that all has to do with just even living, right? living so we're not doing like a thousand things and trying to do this actually very special thing that we do as independent artists. You know, we're, we are where all the cool, crazy um, and weird and new ideas come from and get discovered. So what we do is special. I just want to keep reminding you of that. Um, you know, so 
so that's money and living and it does seem like the answer but it's not the only thing we need especially black indigenous and people of color um you know money or winning competitions you know it it doesn't actually make you more favorable necessarily and i know this because i've approached presenters with both of these things on hand <laughs> so how do you break through um most of the decision making as um Benedict had mentioned, is in the hands of white leadership. Um, there's a Times article that cites that the majority of cultural institutions is run by white people, even though two thirds of New Yorkers are people of color. It was actually like two thirds of cultural institutions run by white people, but that's not who, that's not the population. Um, so we need more advocacy for black indigenous and people of color leadership. Um, and you know, perhaps that means I don't know what that means. I don't really believe that institutions are gonna change, to be honest. Like, I mean, I mean, yes, white male leadership. But I mean, there's also like a lot of white women leaders. Like we need, we need people of color. And um, I, I don't think they're gonna change. I have very little faith. I think we need to start new things, to be completely honest. So I think that it'd be really great if, you know, the government would earmark funds um, or new grants for independent artistic ventures that are being led by, by POC. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong because I was never sure if you're supposed to say BI POC, but anyway. Um, and the other reason we need it is even for ourselves is for our creativity because right now there's just so much capitalizing, um, as Benedict put it, the spectacle of black death. The Whitney has this exhibit up and it's just, it's about COVID and Black Lives Matter. And it's like, we're still in this. That's just not only utterly insensitive, but absolutely amateurish. Like you can't comment on something or, you know, have some perspective on it when you're in it right now. Um, and, you know, if we had just more diverse leadership, we wouldn't have to deal with all this tokenism and yeah, like trauma porn. It puts pressure on us to, to make, to constantly make art about our trauma. Um, so yeah, that's what's on my mind. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Sugar. Uh, so much there to digest. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. There is a lot of optimism that artists host. And then also you made me think, you know, if we look at a lot of the things around us, they are developed and created by artists from the design of things to the functioning of things to how they interact uh, with people in the world. And it's like, how are we uh, supporting us? Like, how are we supporting these people, us, and how are, like, how, and how is the system supporting us, right? Um, I want to also invite folks that are inside of um, the webinar that you can leave, if you have questions, we will have a question and answer portion of the, of this um, evening. You can leave them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And then for folks who are tuning in via uh, YouTube, you can leave the comments, you can leave questions in the comments and we'll um, feed them over and put them in the question and answer as well. All right. Okay. So up next, we have Nico Tower, an intermedia artist and educator. Hi, Nico. Hello. Uh, Nico speaking here. My pronouns are she and her. I am a light skinned Latina with short, dark, wavy hair and long, curly tendrils on the sides of my face. I have a ring in my right nostril and I'm wearing a lavender button down shirt with pinstripes on it. And there's a guitar on the wall behind me. I am here from the land of music and performance art and design and installation and education. So we all need stuff, right? <laughs> uh, and as we are seeing this evening, there is no single way that an artist looks and there is no single way that an artist lives. There's no single way that a a career is born or is made or sustained. We all are just our own selves. <laughs> and so I think that maybe is part of why society hasn't known how to take care of us is they don't know what we are because there's no single narrative and they love single narrative. So <laughs> I'm glad that we are here to name some things and that we can come together. So thank you NY4CA for hosting us. And yeah, so in the last 20 years, I've worked as an artist in, um, in Seattle, Denver, San Diego, San Francisco, and Minneapolis, uh, outside of New York, obviously, um, here now. And the struggles seem common to every, every art city that I've lived in. 
And so, yeah, we're just, we're here to fix it. <laughs> and so in my dreamland, we make use of what is already available to us. I, I believe in my deepest core that there is already enough of everything for everyone, for all of us. There, really, there has to be. I just can't actually fathom that there's not. So the first thing that I'm thinking about is um, space, fallow space. How can space be more porous to the community? Because this, um, thank you, Kat Kirk, for your awesome thought of this like first come first serve. It's just not helpful. It's not helpful. And there's this first come first serve with space. And we all spend so much, not we all, many people spend so much money on rehearsal space, trying to find a place to be, to do their thing, even if just temporarily. And so what if theaters or restaurants or any open room, even better ones without load bearing columns in the middle, <laughs> uh, if like every open room that was closed during the day had some form of residency program that allowed people to utilize their space that's just sitting there anyway. I mean, they're just, they're there. Why, why wouldn't we use it? And so um, I participated in a residency in Seattle that uh, the Cornish Playhouse does that because it was part of their lease when they took it over in Seattle Center. And they have, you can have a residency in the lobby space, uh, in the actual theater, and it leads to a lot of cool site specific work. Um, but then like other ways, I like real estate. So like a lot of my stuff is building oriented. But other ways that this could look is buildings that are under contract or waiting, awaiting occupancy or demolition, but are not being used. We could be setting up really cool temporary installations or having really neat immersive arts projects. And so I'm wondering if the city could offer tax breaks, like they don't even have to give money out of their pocket. They could just collect less later if you, they could give tax breaks to be able to give deductions to building owners who give pro bono short-term leases to immersive performance artists so they can use the space for three months before they tear the building down. Um, oh, what else? I would love to see a unified resource database. Uh, who was it? Oh, it's just Sugar just now talking about not having access to information. So I think to have one place where you can see listing for open spaces that are available, performance opportunities, freelance info, um, services being like financial, medical, whatever, uh, retailers that support independent artists. Um, that would be a great, just make our own social needs for, I don't know, I, I would appreciate that, I guess. Uh, transit. Uh, I'm, the name is blanking me, our very first speaker. I'm trying to look through the, anyway, uh, you talked about accessibility and as a musician, I'm oddly aware of accessibility issues. When you have 40-ish pounds of gear with you always, you know which subway stations have the elevators and you know which corners to go over and you know which big puddles form at which places. And so if they could just, Accessibility helps everybody, actually. <laughs> so would love to see just some more care and attention placed on that. And, and I mean, all artists have gear. Photographers, I have photography gear. If you are an art student, you've got your portfolio. Just, we always have stuff. That's what we do. We move stuff. So um, I would like to see some car share. I know that North America basically made it impossible via policy for that to happen, but it would really be awesome to be able to do that, uh, at least through an artist organization, to be able to leave a car somewhere or have like storage lockers in central locations that are safe in the city or something, um, or storage facilities, I don't know. Uh, as far as housing, obviously we all agree we want accessible housing, but I think that it would be also cool to expand maybe how we look at that I, I see a pattern in all the cities that I've lived in where they build an artist building or put some housing up, but it's in a quote unquote undesirable area, which is a problem by itself uh, to call it that. But they put it in one of those places and that, because that's where they can buy up space and just put the artists, right? And then I, I believe that it contributes to like the spark of the gentrification cycle because all of a sudden the neighborhood is full of art, which everybody loves. And of course it makes a neighborhood wonderful and then people come in and raise the rent and push out the people that were making the neighborhood wonderful. But we even pushed out the people that were there before that and that was their neighborhood. So they probably thought it was wonderful too. So 
can we maybe look at spreading out artist housing all over the city? People have all sorts of lives. People have families, people have children. Some people need a house to live in with their family. Some people need a studio apartment. Uh, music people need, you know, basements are great for rehearsal space. But if you are a visual artist, you need, we need above ground spaces available to us too. So we can have natural light and air. Everybody needs air. Um, dance people need big open rooms. Just, I think that it'd be neat to have more mixed use spaces like live work stuff. I think a lot of artists that I talk to really wanna have collectives. And I think that part of the collective is where you're gonna live and where you're gonna work. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity to rezone things or to just give us space. <laughs> um, I think that there could be more mentorship programs uh, in institutions. This kind of ties back to my ideas about being porous with the community, but it would be very cool if you are a student at an institution to be able to, through your school, have a mentorship residency with an artist from the community that you admire, that you want to bring into the space for free um, and be with and learn from. Uh, what else? I think that the city could fund art in more places by subsidizing, like providing funding to local independent businesses for bringing in music programming so that they can pay us so that we get a guaranteed pay so it's not just playing for tips so they can guarantee pay for artists and not have it come out of their you know already struggling bottom line i think that it would be cool to have back lines which means like equipment that's just there set up so that we don't have to carry stuff around all the time so what if they put local businesses in touch with local retailers to be able to like support and subsidize the purchase of that gear um, I think they could stop curating in some ways that make open stages that just build stages in every parks and rec area and have an online platform where you sign up and you, it's a guaranteed paid slot. And it, that I guess is first come first serve, but they could make numbers to track and make sure people don't hoard. And I know that starts to get kind of big brother socialist style, but I have some socialist thoughts. Um, and I think that ultimately this kind of requires a census project. I don't know like what you have to study to be a person that counts people, but I think that we really need to know like who, how actual many of us there are and what mediums we're working in and where we're located and what family structures we have. And if we have a preferred schedule, like do we want seasonal work or is it you want to work over the weekend always? Or do you want to do a monthly five day residency at a resort or, I think that there are a lot of ways to structure it, but it really, it creates a whole economy for like production technicians, for event people, for program managers. Um, I think, yeah, everybody wins, but I think that treating space, physical space differently would be a really um, doable first step for just changing the landscape. And I think that's all my thoughts. Um, and oh yeah, where would the money come from? former police budget and you know they could fold it into the New York lottery and put it with our like the parks and rec parks and rec and those are all of my thoughts thank you so much I am Nico and thought this is Melanie here thank you Nico so much as particularly for uplifting the idea of mixed-use spaces and also this occupancy the this advocacy around unoccupied spaces and the, what we can do with them also public spaces um, all important things. And also, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but the shout out to the census, which hopefully we are all doing. So thank you so much. Um, up next, we have Rafael Espinal, Executive Director of the Freelancers Union. Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Hey, Melanie, how are you? Uh, I'm Rafael Espinal. My preferred pronouns are he and him. I'm a light-skinned Latino with medium length, dark, wavy hair, with a beard, and a big smile. I'm wearing a long sleeve blue denim shirt and sitting down in front of a white wall with a white guitar and a yellow poster that reads, Organize and Mobilize. Thank you, NY4CA, for having me. I am the new executive director of the Freelancers Union, an organization whose mission is to advocate and support independent workers, including artists, our focus has been to build community for a fractured workforce, curate services and products to help instead of exploit freelancers 
and advocate for changes in laws that support independent workers. Working with the city, we also created a free co-working space for our members in Brooklyn called the Freelancers Hub, uh, which has now gone virtual because of COVID. And we now provide programming that's free around wellness, upskilling, and legal and tax support. We represent over 500,000 members across the country, which have been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And at the height of pandemic, we found that over 80% of our members were out of work, meaning, as we all know, they can't pay rent, can't buy groceries, and manage all the other costs of living. Relief has been a main focus over the past four months. We've been pushing to extend unemployment assistance that continues to include independence, canceling rent, and a monthly stimulus check for all. I think that now more than ever, we have an opportunity to raise the voices of freelancers and artists and use this moment to make it clear to society and to our government that it's time that we recognize and, and, and be treated with the same respect as all other entities and stakeholders in our society. I'm a former elected official. I was a city councilman here in New York. Uh, I recently resigned back in January and I was one of the few that spoke up for artists. In my time, I spearheaded the repeal of the racist and homophobic cabaret law, which didn't allow dancing in spaces across the city. Uh, and was a tool that the use that police used to go after venues that they not and communities did not agree with. And I can tell you through that experience, the majority of elected officials don't truly understand the importance of artists to our city and communities. And I think it's time to change that. End thought. Awesome, thank you so much, Rafael. Um, and particularly for the cabaret law, I was so surprised to know that it was in effect as long as it was, yeah. you know? It's crazy. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, all right, so we have one more speaker and then uh, just to let give you everyone a heads up, we're gonna have like a five minute break um, and then we'll come back for a question and answer portion. Again, if you would like to post your questions in the question and answer queue, the box, so that our panelists can answer it, you can do so, it's at the bottom of your screen. Also for folks on YouTube, you can post your questions in the chat and we will get them over to um, the webinar Zoom. All righty. So for our last speaker, we have Edissa Weeks, educator at Queens College and also director of Delirious Dances. Thank you, Edissa, for being here. All right. Very, very excited to be here and inspiring to hear what everyone's saying. Um, I might reiterate some of the things, but the, the importance of some of these issues is, and the need for them is huge. Um, also in preparation for this panel, I spoke with uh, several recent Queens College dance alumni, as well as uh, colleagues. Um, so what I'm sharing is not only my thoughts. And I realized I forgot to introduce myself. Um, let's see, uh, this is Edissa. I am a brown skin black woman. I have a big fro that's starting to gray. I'm wearing these big uh, gold circle earrings and a blue patterned dress. Behind me is a purple wall and uh, two paintings and a sculpture. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm also gonna read from my notes just so that I don't forget anything. A huge need is affordable, subsidized, working class artist housing. Um, a lot of Queens College students, when they graduate, end up living like five or six people to apartment because that's what they can afford. Um, however, it's very hard to exist in New York um, without that sort of uh, collaborative community support. And you need space where you can think. And if you're living with so many people, it's sometimes hard to think. Um, there are very currently very few artist housing in New York City. Um, so I'm wondering, can there be like four or five artist housing in each borough? So it's actually, uh, there's a way of spreading out the resources so, and easier to access housing, affordable housing. Uh, healthcare, not health insurance is another big one. Um, I don't think we're gonna get healthcare with whichever administration comes next. So can New York State actually implement its own healthcare system? Um, is there a way that we can expand upon Medicare and Medicaid and actually lead the country in providing healthcare for our citizens? 
Um, daycare is a huge one. Um, if I, I had my way, I would require every single cultural institution to put uh, health daycare in their bylaws because then they would be mandated to provide it. Um, one of the biggest things that prevent many people with kids, especially from going to see the theater is the cost of childcare. And so how can we make going to the theater more affordable and accessible for people? This is kind of a, a peeve of mine because one of the things I noticed when I was on the Bessie committee is that I was going to see dance concerts and practically everyone making the choreography, dancing in the choreography as well as in the audience had gone to college. And why this is an issue is only, I think now it's like 34% of the population actually goes to college. And so if we can't reach out to the majority of Americans, the dance field is gonna be in a real uh, place of becoming this elitist and unconnected uh, uh, community. So we need to find ways to connect and daycare is one of them. Um, I was very sad when Spaceworks closed because it was really serving a need for artists in terms of uh, providing affordable artist housing. Sorry, artist rehearsal space. Woo, slow down. I'm like nervous and excited. Okay. Um, for a lot of my uh, Queens College dance majors, it becomes really difficult to pursue a career as a choreographer after graduating because of the cost of rehearsal studios. And um, one of the issues is that they kind of get into some of these subsidized rehearsal spaces because they don't have a track record as an artist or they don't have a 501c3 or they don't have a fiscal sponsorship. And it was really amazing for me how many Queens College dance graduates were actually using space at Spaceworks and now that is gone. So I'm wondering if the city can reinstate in all the boroughs uh, affordable rehearsal space and also make it part of um, the cultural institution group so that the city council is actually helping pay for the operating costs of these centers. Um, we need a community cultural hub and again in each of the boroughs and these hubs would be all inclusive and a way as normalizing the art experience for just the average person in the city. So ideally it's a place where you could go grocery shopping, you could do your banking, you could go to the post office, you could also um, take dance classes or take acting and music classes. You, there would be rehearsals there, there would be theaters there. So it's a really a way of integrating the arts into community as opposed to being these like elitist institutions on the hill. Um, you know, as so many malls are, especially outside of New York City are uh, closing, you know, can they be repurposed to become these cultural hubs? Um, one thing that I'm also hearing a lot of is, especially for people who are just emerging into the dance scene or the art scene in general, is that um, they're looking for mentorship um, as well as life skills. Uh, can they be introduced? Can these can it all be put into these same cultural hubs? So it's a way of giving people like an introduction to the business of the arts, um, like how to do taxes, how to do grant writings, how to save for a 501, uh, 401k. Uh, can there be technology training? Um, can there be sort of like an artist starter kit where people could take dance classes, um, get discounted tickets to performances? and really get a start in mentoring their career as, as artists. Um, another thing that would be awesome is if every single paycheck listed how our state and federal taxes are being spent. So that on that paycheck, you would see how much money is going towards the military, how much money is going towards art, uh, arts, programming, how much of it going to social services, to infrastructure support. Because then I feel like the average person would actually really understand how much money is going towards the military and then how little is going towards education, infrastructure and the arts. And so that, that would really help with advocacy. Um, we desperately need a dancers union 
And what would be amazing if students graduating from college or from an arts high school could have the choice to join the union. And the union would be a place where they could uh, ensure that dancers are paid a minimum wage. Um, could they establish a universal payment program? I love that idea of a basic income so that people are not just going gig to gig, but somehow they can have uh, payments and income throughout the year. Um, could dance union also, this dance union also help with getting access to health care? Could it provide counseling and career opportunities? But again, could this be connected to this sort of idea of a cultural hub? Um, another big issue is for kids in public schools. Um, can there be an arts day? So, but one for dance, one for music, one for theater, one for visual arts, and where they'll be introduced to possible careers in, the, in those fields, uh, as well as um, meet people, see role models, find out about opportunities in terms of jobs and internships, and as well as uh, if they wanna to go to college, college programs in the arts. I think part of this is also how do we educate community, educate families that it's actually possible to have a successful career as an artist. Um, another important thing is uh, decolonizing the curriculum in schools as well as in cultural programming and in major institutions. And uh, so that there's more of a diversity of dance styles um, that are being presented and valued um, and can it be like for all these schools and institutions that they don't get any funding unless they can show that they've actually really integrated diversity into their programs, into their curriculum, into their staff, into their boards, into their programming. Um, essentially, we need a radical revolution of values that promotes people over corporations. Yeah, that how can we invest in society and in people? All right, that was my, my, my dreams for the city. Thank you, Edissa, for sharing your dreams of the city. And what did you say? You said ra radical revolutionary values? A radical revolution of values. Yes, a radical. It's not new, that's from Martin Luther King. Thank and you. And so it needs to be, it needs to happen. I hear that. Thank you so much. And also, I love this idea, like once we get those checks, let them be transparent. Let us know what we're like, like I saw Nico put in the chat, what are we paying for? Um, so thank you so much. All right, folks. So now um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a five minute break. And, and we come when we come back, we will answer questions, have discussions. I, there's like the chat is on fire. So I know a lot of you have some some things to add and say. Um, so please just take a moment to stretch, drink some water, think of your questions, put them in the question and answer uh, bucket there, and uh, we'll be back. Um, and in the meantime, we have a census message from Cardi B. New York City, 2020 is a huge opportunity to make our voice heard. This year, we have the power to decide our city's future, not just for the next four years, but for the next 10 by getting counted in the census. The census is about power, money, and respect for our communities. If our city is undercounted, we risk being underrepresented, especially our communities of color. In 2010, only 62% of New Yorkers responded to the census with the lowest response rates in our black and brown communities. In 2020, I'm gonna tell you something, we can let this happen again. If you want to stand up to the status quo and the five people in power who wants to silence us, Start by getting counted in the census. The census is safe, easy for everyone. And remember, the citizenship question is off the census. No matter what anybody tells you, immigrants with or without papers count too. Mi gente presente. Go to my2020census.gov now and fill out 10 simple questions to get counted. 
Nueva York, 2020 es una gran oportunidad para hacer que nuestras voces se oigan. Este año tenemos el poder de determinar el futuro de nuestra ciudad, no solo para los próximos cuatro años, sino los próximos diez, a través de ser contado en el censo. El censo se trata del poder del dinero y del respeto para nuestras comunidades. Si nuestra ciudad es subcontada, corremos el riesgo de ser subrepresentados, especialmente en la comunidad de color. En el 2010, solo el 62% de New Yorkinos respondieron al censo, con las tasas de respuestas más bajas en comunidades negras y marrones. En 2020, no podemos dejar que esto pase de nuevo. Si quieres resistir este status quo y desafiar a la persona en el poder que quieren silenciarnos, empieza por hacerse contado en el censo. El censo es seguro y fácil para todos. Y acuérdate, la pregunta de ciudadanía no aparece en el censo. Inmigrantes documentados o indocumentados también cuenta. Mi gente presente. Visita my2020census.gov ahora y llena las 10 preguntas simples para hacerse contar. Hello, hello. Welcome back. So yes, yeah, so now we are at the point, I guess I'll just wait for folks to um, slowly arrive. Um, I think, is this a moment to let us see all the panelists? I think so. 
Let me see. Um, so yeah, we're gonna jump into the question and answer portion of the day. Let's see what questions we have here. And so we'll just pose them and um, whichever, again, this is Melanie, and any panelists that feels um, they want to sort of touch on this uh, topic, please feel free. Um, so we did, okay, so for some of the advocacy work we talked about it, um, there was a lot of mention of uh, dance and um, music. Um, Nina asked if we can address some advocacy efforts that actually will um, address the field at large. Um, does anyone feel uh, compelled to address that? Um, I know that some folks mentioned things that would, would affect the field at large, including um, universe, like healthcare and uh, um, housing, but are there any other things that folks would like to bring forth? Yes, Nico. Um, I wonder if we maybe like get our thinking engines extra. I think the space to me was one that affected all the people I may not have spoken to, but I think that like, of course, having a place to live, but also like workspace, whether no matter what it is you're doing, like it is actually very luxurious to not have to like wake up and like look at a wall full of music gear. It's like nice to wake up in an empty room and I'd like to just go somewhere and do my work. I would like to just go some like, and so, yeah, that's like a super privilege to have somewhere to go to do your work. And I think we all deserve that. <laughs> and so no matter what our medium, so maybe, I don't know if that's a proper response to that, but that's my thought. Anyone else? All right, we'll hop into the next question. And if, oh, Benedict, yes. Yeah. Um, what uh, I, from that article that I put in the chat, um, I'll paste it in again in a second, but I've also just been feeling um, also some reticence towards the idea of artists as a unique, like special class separate from other workers and thinking about the movements that are happening now, you know, across the country in Kenosha and Portland here in New York, um, fighting for black lives and, you know, all of the questions that we're talking about are, are things that protesters that we've been fighting for on the ground, you know, in this time. And make, thinking of our, like, thinking of ourselves as just artists is maybe a limited way to think about housing or healthcare. Um, of course, we have particular housing and healthcare needs and, but just thinking about ourselves as artists, I, have been, I felt limited by that at times in the past few months. Thank you, Benedict, I hear that. I also agree that also there's this, um, a lens of looking at us as workers as well, that's really important um, as part of the working class of folks um, in the struggle as well. Lucy, did you have a thought? I, I just see the, um... I'm with New York for Cultural Arts as well. And um, I just see that there, you know, I really liked the thing of, you know, an artist isn't one thing. And I see definitely threads through all of the different things that would be, you know, that people brought up that would be good in terms of what dancers need or, or et cetera. Um, I think that it is possible to 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 link those threads um, with these ideas that several of you have been speaking about in terms of unionization, in terms of finding solidarity with each other, and and indeed the freelancers union is not 
just artists. It is with, you know, it is with, with gig workers. And so I think that the jump to making it more broad advocacy is, 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 is not a big leap. So um, there are lots of things, you know, affordable housing is going to benefit everyone um, and the different strategies. I thought you all were brilliant coming up different ways that we might access affordable housing. And, um, and, and we, as we move towards that, absolutely keeping in mind that it should be a new paradigm, a new structure for working people, for how we, you know, a radical revolution in values for how we reset that. So um, anyway, I just wanted to say that about advocacy is that it's, it doesn't need to be pinpointed. I think that linking those threads together is a natural way to move forward. Melanie here, thank you, Lucy. Okay, so for our next question, it's from Ted Berger. Um, the question is, what do folks know about the job programs that were developed by government in the past, including WPA, CETA, CETA, Peace Corp, and AmeriCorps? Um, what do you think about those programs and how they may, or how might they be adopted to your needs today? I'll hop on that. Um, the WPA was an amazing program because it employed a lot of people out of the 30s from the depression. And so many people of uh, in the African American community and the Latino community, Latinx community were got jobs, whether it was uh, working as reporters or working as artists or working um, going in and collecting songs from different communities. And an infusion like that right now, because in a sense we're in a depression and we need that kind of infusion of funding into the community would be amazing in terms of just recording what's happening, the different stories of people. Um, you know, could you have StoryCorps for the arts community where people are going in and uh, educating and talking with people and gathering information? For me, this is also about normalizing the arts. So it becomes part of a community as opposed to something that's elitist and you, you have to have money in order to do but how do we make the art something that's uh, a vibrant way to make a living and that's vibrant for anybody to choose to make a living in, that, in those fields, in different fields. Um, I have mixed feelings about AmeriCorps and Peace Corps, um, mainly because they uh, required like a, a two-year commitment. They also, the CIA was very involved in some of those organizations. And so it becomes a little bit more complex because um, how are you actually information mining or how are you actually empowering communities? Um, but again, what was nice about AmeriCorps is that, and Peace Corps, I'm not sure about Peace Corps, but I know with AmeriCorps, if you worked for AmeriCorps and for two years, your student loans would be or, uh, waived. And so in terms of not leaving school with this huge massive debt, I mean, that was, that's a huge gift for a lot of people. Thank you, Edissa. Um, so another question, um, I should say, does anyone else want to tackle that? All good, going once, going twice. All right, next question. Um, this question is, so predominantly white arts institutions are demonstrating that um, there's a, they prioritize their own survival over artists' actual needs. Wealthy donors get pat, on the, pat, pat themselves on the back uh, for their generous donations that don't provide living wages or sustainable conditions for artists. How can artists band together to show PWIs that we can create our own abundance? We don't need them. This is from an anonymous attendee. Don't all answer at once. I, I, I would say uh, we all will have to play an active role in supporting those organizations that are doing the work. Um, and it, it really comes down and to be just to be straight honest is that money do keep the lights on, right? And the only way an organization can run is if they're able to fundraise, if they're able to, to get funding from a source 
And unfortunately, a lot of these organizations do depend on these bigger corporations and, and these entities uh, that don't have the best interests of, of the artists and, and the folks that are representing, uh, which is why it's important that people speak up from a ground from the grassroots level and say, we are taking control because we're going to play an active role in, in creating the narrative of how this organization is going to move forward. And that might include uh, putting some sweat equity in, that might include donating $5. You know, I myself, a um, big supporter of Bernie Sanders' campaign, because I think he was the first political candidate to show that you don't need money from big donors, from big corporations in order uh, to put forward a, a, a campaign for the people. Uh, if, if it's grassroots led, if it's grassroots funded, if it's if people in the grassroots are involved, uh, you can create real change, real structural systemic change. Uh, so it, it will take all of us to get involved uh, to, to demand that and make that happen. I'd just like to jump in again. This is Lucy Sexton, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. Um, uh, to continue on what you're saying, Raphael, is it's also um, looking at the philanthropic structures, um, and 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 there is advocacy being done within the philanthropic world, um, and to push on those uh, organizations as well. Um, uh, those those funding and the people who work in the funding uh, structures, because that that can start to shift the narrative. The most important thing, which you all are demonstrating so beautifully tonight, and all of us as artists are, is we have to realize our own power. Um, those organizations don't exist without us, without you. Um, and, and, and so they, they, that you, are, you are the most important part of that organization, even if you're just there for one time, one six weeks stretch to do a show, um, and to just really feel that and know that. I know that structure is built to make you feel the exact opposite, but um, the truth is the reverse. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I wanna try to go to one of the hand raised um, over in the chat. Uh, I'm going to um, select Anira whose hand is up to see if you wanted to ask a quick question. Let's see if it's working. Can Janira unmute? Janira, can you unmute yourself? Do you have that capacity? Okay. I've unmuted. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm did did somebody ask me a question? Oh yeah, your hand was raised. And so I wanted to see if you had anything. If you oh, had a question. Yeah. I am so sorry about that. I did not mean to raise my hand. That oh, was my 12 year old son who <laughs> raised my hand. Fantastic. Well, maybe he had a question. All good. Well, thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Thank you for being here. Yes. So happy to be here. Thanks. Um, so in the time that we have left, I just want to uh, pose a quick question to our panelists. And um, if you just want to provide one or two words, the question is, again, I asked this earlier. So as we reimagine rebuilding New York City as a sustainable space for artists, what are what is the thing that you need the most? So we can just sort of popcorn, just give us some thoughts. This is Audrey speaking. Um, accessibility just across the board, like communi community transformation, community transformation to organize and move toward universal healthcare and universal income so that people can actually continue supporting communities and do the work that um, governments and institutions won't do so that we can shift power, end thought. Definitely seeking transparency. You know, why is this happening? Where is it coming from? Who is it coming from? The cost of things, the accessibility to resources. I think so much of um, a roadblock in 
my course and some of, and a lot of what I've witnessed is such a lacking of transparency and it's um, very intentionful. I'm going to make that up. It's, it's very direct and it's very obvious to hoard power and secrets and privacy and to keep things the way they are. So I just, um, I need transparency and I am working and putting my weight behind um, advocating for more transparency and being very clear about why I believe it's needed and in uh, the dance world, the arts world, the performing world, cultural workers world, all of our multifaceted um, spaces that we hold. Hi, Benedict here. Um, I'll say no police, no prisons, total abolition. Hi, Nico here. And uh, I would like sustainability. I don't want like a, a placation. I want a thing that actually can feed itself. And I want care. Like I would like to be cared about by my state and government. And I just some hospitality and thought. Hi, David Gonsier here. Also, just side note, y'all, I was so nervous about giving my intro earlier. I literally forgot to introduce myself. I can't believe I remembered my own name. Uh, I forgot a member of our steering committee. Megan, if you're still here, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Megan Wright has been a, a huge part of our efforts at the ANC. Um, my thing that while we're talking about funding coming from various areas and getting past uh, the nonprofit industrial complex, um, if we're going to talk about funding and from granting organizations, uh, I would love for those granting organizations to require any kind of transparency like Kat was talking about into where that money goes. Um, lots of organizations are evaluated on all kinds of, you know, uh, what kind of like fiscal capabilities they have and their engagement with their communities, but no one is usually asking questions of like, are you paying your employees anything? Um, are you caring for their needs at all? Are you even listening to those needs? Um, and we would love, I would love um, some form of transparency in that area of holding uh, recipients of grants responsible for if they are also paying employees that those employees be treated with dignity. Thanks everybody. I would share that there's not one thing that needs to be done. I mean, we're an ecosystem, so you, it really needs to be approached from different perspectives. Like how can we um, invest in education, abolish prisons, um, don't shop at businesses or watch shows that don't support your values or empower community? Um, how can we, uh, if we vote someone into office, whether it's a, community board or the president, we need to stay on top of them. It's like we need to hold them accountable for the decisions that they're making. And so you can't just go, I got someone in that I liked or someone came in that I don't like, so I'm going to not engage. That they want us to not engage. So it's really important that we engage and even some small thing like uh, tutoring or um, volunteering in a local community garden, all of that are these little steps that help empower the larger. Sugar going once, going twice. Sorry, I didn't realize I was once. I was just taking it on. Um, I would like to second care that Nico mentioned. Like, I, I don't know, like, um, I don't know, I think a lot about, I guess, how I, like, my early days as an artist. And I just, there's just this, there is a lack of care all around, not just about, like, what we do as artists, but even just, um, like starting from, I mean, a lot of us did go to school and I don't think that necessarily should be, like, should be a necessary part of being an artist, but a lot of us did go and there's just this lack of care even starting from there, you know? Um, 
like, I can't believe that the fact the advisor, <clears throat> the advisor of the piano department actually encouraged me to go to school. And it's like, like they didn't even care about whether or not I could afford it. You know, I asked if I could go part-time so that I can pay for school while I'm in school. And she's like, yeah, but then you'll lose, you know, your fellowship, which is a job. You know, that's what you get for going to that school is you get a job. And so it's like, great. So you'll either have no job, but you could go part-time or go full-time and at least be able to make your living expenses. So I, I had to just choose. Um, so yeah, definitely care and just, I mean, I know it's subjective, but just more like ethical behavior across the board across the board like we need it I mean I'm, and frankly sometimes artists treat each other like shit <laughs> like I get so pissed when I hear about artists asking other artists to do stuff for free and I know we're all broke but like it's okay okay fine like right after school or whatever but some people operate like this for you know a couple of years I've, and I've never done that and it was hard but um yeah we just need we just need more um yeah, ethical behavior across the board, which I know is broad, but wouldn't quite. <laughs> no, that's good. That's a place to start. Uh, so thank you, Sugar. Um, I just want to again thank everyone for attending and being here. Thank you, Audrey, Benedict, Kat, David, Sugar, Nico, Rafael, and Edisa. Thank you, art activists, past, present, future. And thank you all, again all for coming. Um, we are at New Yorkers for Culture and Art super excited to see how this work will unfold and continue to support advocacy efforts. And as our, for our final thoughts, I will turn it over to Lucy Sexton, Executive Director of NY4CA. Uh, just gratitude. Um, it, so many good ideas, so much creativity, so much care and, and compassion. And, and it's, our job and this is what uh, Melanie is heading up and we hope that we will continue this is just the beginning but to develop a wing of our advocacy that is really around uh, recreating the city so that it empowers and makes life sustainable and dignified for individual artists and um, you know that uh, that's an exciting new place for us to be going. Um, a lot of our advocacy so far has been with, you know, for organizations and for the field, um, but this is necessary and good and I'm excited to do the work and I'm glad that Melanie is leading it. So, and thanks for all of you for participating. Yes, thank you. And it's a community collaborative effort. I feel like all of this, it takes a village. So again, I'm look, looking forward and excited to see all that is to come. Thank you all. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you uh, to our transcriptionists and to our ASL interpreters. Thank you so much. And to SFG. See y'all soon. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Be well. <laughs>